much detail because it's really confusing, all right, is when we think of God, we think of God in three persons. We think of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And confusing me even more, even though He is all three persons, He's still only one God. And you say, I got that figured out. You're lying, all right? It's not made to be figured out that all three of them are we worship as God, but they work separately. God is sitting on the throne. Jesus is sitting on the right hand. And yet, they're one. I don't get it. I don't need to get it. I will understand it when I'm in heaven in my glorified body, and I'm not limited to this body and this brain at the moment. But when we think about the Holy Spirit, when Jesus died and He rose again, as He was ascending to heaven, He told them, it won't be long before I will send a comforter, a spirit to you. He said in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. I was asked, is there a difference between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? Nope. It really is just the same term, depending on which passage you pull it from, context, things of that nature. But it's the Holy Spirit. And so in Act, later in Acts, we find that He came down, and He worked, and He gave His apostles great power. Great power to be able to do great things. And the reason for the great power at the time was the Bible was not completed yet, so He filled His apostles with power to help start the church and to write the Bible that we now hold on to today. But then, in our day and age, it's a little different. But we still have this. Two things, then it comes to the Holy Spirit. One is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe fully that it happens when you're saved. The moment you are saved, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, dwells inside of you, and He is there permanently. Now, there's a difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Baptism means the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Filling means that the Holy Spirit controls me. He guides me. He leads me. He directs me. The first one happened at salvation. It was a choice. When I got saved, God gave to me. The second one is my choice. The second one is my choice. Whether I choose to allow the Holy Spirit to give His control. One of the things that God gave man... I understand the premise, but if I were God, I probably wouldn't have. It's called the free will of man, all right? Because you know what happens when man gets free will? They have the right to say no, all right? They have the right to say, I don't want anything to do with this. So therefore, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I have a right to say, I want to do this my way, even though the Holy Spirit still lives inside of me. Throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a fire, often as a fire. It is used to help us understand that fires are helpful but requires our attention to be effective. So this begs the major question, what role do I have in the Holy Spirit's effect on my life? I ask, as I've heard so many people, I used to think this, this is going to sound somewhat, shall we say blasphemous? It's not. But as I go through my mind, I'm thinking, is he so weak that I can just kind of you know, stop him? that easily? Am I more powerful than him? No, 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 no. It's not that I'm more powerful. It's not that I have to be perfect to be filled with him. It's just that I can choose to say no to that Holy Spirit. I can choose to say no to God is basically what's being said. This is the same thing as the free will of man. God has given me a helper. He's given me a comforter. He's given me a guide, and I can choose to ignore that help. Let me give you two verses that explain it, Ephesians 4.30. The Bible says this, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It, we can grieve Him. We can hinder Him. It, it, we can limit His work. The second passage of 2 Timothy 1.6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The gift of God being the Holy Spirit. You stir it up. So we look at these passages and we see that the Holy Spirit is very powerful and very needed, but will not force His influence on, or power on, on us or against our will. Can I tell you what I believe? I believe in this day and age that the Holy Spirit is more limited by Christians than we want to admit. I don't believe we enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit as much as we could, as much as we should. I'm not saying all across board. Some of you, it may be different. I mean in Christendom. I believe that we have lost a lot of what God desired for us to have in our Christian life. So let's look at two things about the Holy Spirit this morning that I believe will be a help to us when we talk about quenching not the Spirit. The first one is the power of the fire. Since He was called a fire, we're going to stick with this, the power of a fire. 
The other night, we had some people, friends over at our house, and we have a, one of those portable fire pits, and so we pulled it out, and we were trying to light it. And um, if you're like me, this sounds a little pyro, but I love fire. I just do. Uh, I love the fact you light something, it burns. Now, if you're not careful, it burns you. Then I don't like fire anymore. All right, so you know that. But I love setting, I, I love having the fire. I love the, the smell. I love the roast, the marshmallows, all those different things that you can do in a fire. And so we're trying to get it going. It wasn't working. Because it, you know, it was cold, and even the cardboard wouldn't burn and everything. So I said, I got an idea. I have lighter fluid in my grill. So I grabbed a lighter fluid. And they had a little fire going. I said, everybody stand back. My son's, why? Because I'm an idiot. Stand back. All right. And I poured it in there. Whoosh. A big flame. And I'm there. If you remember the reference, I have created fire. All right. I thought it was awesome. And it wouldn't go. So I put more on there. And oh, man, it was great. And it was building up. And then I get close and smoke and get in your eye. And you're like, oh, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. And then you go back to doing it again. Right. And you get the fire going. And finally, we got this fire going. It was nice. But you know what's great about fires is, when you're close, they give you warmth. If you're too close, they can hurt. You know, when you think about fire is necessary to heat the home, fire is necessary to cook things, fire in itself is extremely necessary, extremely helpful. But if, if out of control, guess what? Fire can burn your house down. The day before, I was doing some electrical work, and um, I was flipping a switch, and I was kind of picking on my son a little bit, but I told him, I said, I need you to look. It was, the outlet was hanging out. I just laid it, and it was a double breaker. I hadn't swapped the breaker yet, so I wasn't sure if it was sending too much juice. You know, I, I was pretty confident, but I told my son, he goes, what am I looking for? I said, smoke. He's like, what? He said, if you see smoke, tell me. He said, what's going to happen if, you, if I don't? I said, bad things. Just tell me, all right? I flipped the switch, no smoke. Checked it, it worked, and then went through and finished it and did it right. You know why? Because it can turn into something really bad. I was putting an outlet in because our microwave was doing some weird things. And it was, you know, the light was dimming. You know, it was making weird noises. So she's watched because it's on an extension cord. So I stuck it back up there. I'm going to test this thing. And I hit the button. And guess what I got? Sparks and smoke. It was dead. All right? If I let going, the whole house would have been dead. Fire can be a bad thing. You ever sat by a big campfire? We went to the corn maze with the teens, and we're sitting by the campfire. You know what inevitably happens to me? I don't know about you, but when I stand by a campfire, the smoke follows me. I can walk around the campfire, and it follows me. So it's in my face constantly. So I get behind people that I want to bug and let the smoke get them, right? It's, it's, fires are great, and they're needed. But if we're not careful, if we just let it go, th- you know, it was it Thursday night, we started the fire. Then we decided to go play some football. When I got back, the fire was dead. Why? Because it had not been dealt with. So the fire just died off. Let me make a suggestion when we look at the power of the fire. Number one, what does this fire look like? I'm talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit. There are some today that believe the filling of the power of the Holy Spirit are very unique. They make me lose control. They make me act out of character in special ways. Uh, I speak abnormal. I sometimes flailing. Uh, I have no control over my own body. Often, sometimes, appears possess- like possession. Can I suggest to you that that is not the way the Holy Spirit works? At least a lot of people who want to generate a religious feeling, but that is not how the Holy Spirit works. All right, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. I do believe that He can help. I think He strengthens. But when I've watched people and then they have you know, walked off platforms and floated or they're laying on the ground and they can't move and they claim it's the Holy Spirit, that is not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit is not going to force you against your will. You see, what is that? A lot of it's satanic. I'm not saying everybody who dips into some of this is not, but some of it is purely just wrong because people are trying to pull in and trying to look good. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. He's not looking for chaos. He is looking for order and help and strength and encouragement. The Holy Spirit brings a clear mind, strength when I'm in trials, help when I'm hurting, wisdom with others, guidance in dark times. He is a light and a guide to be more like Christ. Not for me to act outside of my own control. Now, by the way, I will sometimes act outside of my own control when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but not different. Let me give you an example. I saw a art news article, I think it was 20, 20 years ago, and they were talking about the insurgents of these new churches coming out. And so I, I, you know, there was multiple kinds of different religions, and so I watched out of curiosity, I think I was young in ministry, and one of them came up, 
And I saw the previous four. It was the very last one. It was the Laughing Revival. And so and I watched this. And there's a guy up nice, a deep voice, easy to listen to. And he was preaching. And the service started off relatively normal. And then all of a sudden, the pastor up front starts, <laughs> a deep voice, starts laughing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, every, other, every other people start laughing. And the more people start laughing. And then literally, people start rolling in the aisles laughing. There's no preaching. There's no singing. There's just people laughing hysterically, rolling in the aisles. And they'll do this for 20, 30 minutes. They are having revival of the Holy Spirit. No, they're laughing. That's all they're doing. All right? It was confusion and crazy and people, and they're walking around. Ah, all kinds of, it's, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. He does not bring chaos. He brings order. He brings help. He brings strength. So, how does this fire work in my life then? Well, it is offered, but not required. The Holy Spirit is offered. He is in me. He lives in me if I'm a Christian, but He does not force me to follow His instruction. I need to allow Him to have freedom. And if I give Him freedom, He will give me power to treat my wife in a way that I'm supposed to, but i really not good at. He will help me to deal with my children in a way that naturally would not be right because I'm, you know, my impatience is not there, but He will give me strength. He will give me strength to witness to somebody when I'm nervous. He will give me wisdom to deal with a scenario that I have no idea how to deal with. He will give me strength in those scenarios but He does not force it upon me. This means we need to, can I use the phrase, stoke the fire? Just like that fire. If I want to keep it going, I've got to add wood to it. I've got to blow on it a little bit. And I've got to find other ways to keep the fire going. And in the Holy Spirit, I've got to be being fed by the Bible and be in church and prayer and letting Him fill me. And if I had to let it go, I miss out on what He wants. Not only is it not offered, and not, it is offered but not required. Number two, it is a result of a desire. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Here's the illustration. Just like someone who has drank too much alcohol and therefore is drunk out of control, he is controlled by the alcohol, the Holy Spirit wants to have that kind of control over us. Not that I'm completely out of control. It's not like I'm sitting back watching someone else control my body. It's that when I make decisions, I realize I'm making decisions that are not natural because the Holy Spirit is leading me. Holy Spirit is guiding me. Holy Spirit is helping me. It's also a result of a walk with God. I cannot have the Holy Spirit if I'm not in His Word. Remember, He is God. So when I worship God, I worship, the Holy, I worship all three. I worship the Holy Spirit. When I read the Bible and I learn more about Jesus and I learn more about God, I learn more about the church, I learn more about Him. If I'm not reading, I'm not in prayer, I'm going to miss out. Now, by the way, when I'm not doing what the Holy Spirit does, He prods me. You know what? Why don't you read a little bit? Spend some time in prayer. I tell you, there's been times. You go a little bit of time, I've been there. And you get to tell I'm missing out on something. You get on your knees or you spend some time in prayer. And you know why? It's amazing that communion just comes right back. That is the Holy Spirit giving us that sweet communion. The Bible also says that when I don't know what to say, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm struggling so much in my prayer that I just kneel there brokenhearted and the Holy Spirit prays for me on my behalf. It's great power to be able to do amazing things, to be able to honor God and to serve in an amazing, faithful way. But I must be walking with Him to enjoy that power. This filling and power cannot come without time. Remember, the Holy Spirit and God are one. Therefore, they work together. The fourth one is, it's a, it's a result of submission and surrender. I like what the Apostle Paul, he called himself a servant or slave. It was a choice. I choose to place myself as a servant. I choose to follow whatever God wants. One of the reasons he was so effective as an apostle is because he placed himself under the authority of God and allowed the Holy Spirit to direct him and to use him in amazing ways. And he said, not my will, but thine. Do what you want, Lord, and I will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is one of the key reasons I believe he was so effective because of his willingness to follow. So we see how this, what it looks like and how this fire works. And he teaches, he encourages. Let me tell you, you ever had a situation where you get in a fight with somebody? You know the Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. But there's only certain words coming to your mind. And you don't want to say those words because they can get you in trouble. You see which words you're talking about, pastors? The one you're thinking about right now works just fine, all right? Those things where you just want to go out, right? 
You know, someone's been mean to you. You know, you go, how many went Black Friday shopping? Bless your heart. All right, bless your heart. I did not, okay? I went out later the next day. Some, you know, Black Friday shopping is kind of like, I love lines, okay? That's what it was. I love standing in the cold. And, but, so you go out there, you get in line. I watch, I love watching TV, uh, they're in the news broadcast, and they talk about Black Friday shopping. And I watched one where someone, I don't know what store, she's trying to rip the boxes off to open up the boxes so that people can get to the to prizes, whatever it was that she was selling. And as she's trying to do it, people are pushing her, and she's turning around yelling. You know, if you're trying to grab this item that you're saving $10 on, right, okay, and you're trying to grab it, and someone hits you, you turn around, they're like, get all the way, and they start yelling at you. Let me ask you, the Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath. What's going through your mind while trying to grab that at device? Not a soft answer, is it? No. You need the Holy Spirit to help you from sharing the rest of your mind with that person. You need help. The same thing, parents. When kids come to you, and they say, Dad, I'm dealing with this. How do I help? How do I get over this? We're not there to punish anymore. They're there to instruct. And as a dad, sometimes they're like, man, I don't know. We need the Holy Spirit. Moms, when our daughters come to us and say, I'm really hurting in this area, what do you do? Sometimes you don't have an answer. You need the Holy Spirit to give you answers. There have been times I've been asked questions about things, and the moment I get asked a question, I'm like, Lord, help, Lord, help, Lord, help, Lord, help. Man, where is Bob Noble? when you need him, right? I am struggling. What do I do? And as I'm listening... The Lord gives an answer that would not have been mine. And then when I'm done, I'll call somebody, was I right? They're like, man, that was really good. How'd you get that? I don't know. I have no idea where it came from. That is the Holy Spirit. When I'm struggling, when I'm afraid, that is the Holy Spirit. He is that comforter. He is that help. He is that guide. But I must let him have that freedom. The second thing we see is the quenching of this fire. The quenching of the fire. Number one, how do I quench this fire? How do I do it? How is this fire quenched? Let me give you a couple thoughts. Number one, neglect. Neglect. Lack of fuel or lack of care. With the fire, you've got to add some level of fuel to it, whether you're silly like me and pouring lighter fluid or gasoline or something crazy like that, or just adding more wood or charcoal or whatever it is you're burning. It needs fuel. When I at one point was burning, uh, heating our house with a pellet stove, when it would run out, you got to dump pellets in there. It has to have some level of fuel to produce heat. How do it? How do I? Lack of fuel. Lack of time with God. Lack of listening. I disappear from church and I disappear from God and I do very little time. Guess what? I'm going to quench spirit. Not only that, lack of care. You know why some people struggle? with not having really the feeling of the Holy Spirit, they don't care much about it. I don't mean that they're like, I don't want it. I, care, I don't care at all. They don't find the need for it. I'm good. I can handle this situation. I can handle my finances. I can handle my kids. I can handle this. I can handle that. Can I tell you, there's very little in life I can handle. When I handle things outside the Holy Spirit, it just falls apart. And then people laugh at you. I mean, it's just the way it works. You know, because you don't have a Holy Spirit to help you when you really, really need it. And by the way, there are some times that God will allow you to go through a battle that is extremely serious. And you know what you need? You need the Holy Spirit or else you're going to collapse. That's sometimes why God allows us to go through those so that we can see our need. If we choose to neglect the Lord, neglect our time with Him, His teaching, His leading, we will have limited to no power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because it needs fuel. We must spend time that's how we quench it. Think about some other things that will struggle if I neglect my time with God, if I allow the fire to go out. Number one, relationships. How will my relationship with my wife and my kids if I neglect God and the Holy Spirit? How about work? Am I going to be the great employee I need to be? Am I going to be effective at my job if the Holy Spirit doesn't give me strength? Think about the idea of gardening. I don't garden much. I move things for my wife. That's all I do, all right? I don't garden. I usually rip my hands up doing that anyway. But when we first bought the house, we pulled up. The guy told us, he's like, now, this house has not been taken care of. And, uh, and so we'd passed it a couple of times because you couldn't see the house over the landscaping. And so we pulled up to it, and my wife goes, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And they had done massive amounts of landscaping on the front, but it was tall. So the bushes had grown to be about, I think, about seven foot tall. And so we're going up the sidewalk, 
And the realtor was real nice. He goes over and he grabs the bushes and he pulls them back so that we can get through the landscaping to get into the house. Can't see the sidewalk. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I gotta cut all this out. I mean, I was just like, Lord, make this be a dumpy house, please. I gotta cut this out. And no, guess what happened? We walked in and it was dumpy, but she goes, It's got everything I want. Yay! And I thought I get to cut it out. And for the next two years, I'm chopping away at roots. Because below all that lovely, ugly gardening was the big tree behind, just growing through. But you know what happened? When I first went up, it was ugly. I mean, absolutely disgusting. I remember the first winter, it was covered in snow. So we had pictures where the snow looks like it's eight feet high. It's on top of these bushes. I'm like, Lord, kill the bushes with the snow. Come on, help me out here. I'm telling you, these, 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 these roots are huge on these bushes. But I asked the neighbor, because in the back, there were bushes across the, the one fence that were rolled over, and there was a tree that had knocked over, and instead of fixing it, they just put pots on top of it. And there was another tree in the corner, and it was surrounded. And I was asked the neighbor, I said, Mike, What's up with all the bushes? He said they didn't want anybody to see them. So they just made let everything grow. They didn't care. And it just grew out of control. He would ask them, can I fix these things? And they said, no. Poison ivy had grown everywhere, grown into his yard and all over the place. And he's like, can I fix this for you? No, they didn't care. You know, three years later, I walk around my house. The really big bushes are gone. I have scars to prove it. I, their bushes are gone. Nice landscaping. The trees in the back are gone. Why? Because I'm married to someone who cares. I didn't say I cared. You caught that. All right? I'm married to someone who cares. And she makes it beautiful. And I'm glad it's beautiful. Let me tell you, when you spend time with God and allow Him to work, and you give the Holy Spirit freedom. You know what? He will turn your life into a beautiful garden. Can we use that illustration? Where people see it and say, man, it looks great. Now, you're still going to have struggles. I'm not saying life's perfect. But I'm saying, boy, you will be able to handle things differently and you'll see God work. But if you decide to ignore God, your life is getting to be like when we bought the house. Overgrown. And it says, like, no one cares. Because I haven't let the Holy Spirit have His way. I have quenched the Holy Spirit. The second one is a chosen quenching. You know the way to get rid of a fire? Put water on it. Put dirt on it. Squelch it. Another way to quench the Holy Spirit is to choose to do it. How do we choose to quench the Spirit? Wrong devotion? Wrong direction? Wrong delights? Some of it's by sin. When I am tempted to sin, the Holy Spirit says, you don't want to do that, you don't want to do that. He gives me reasons not to, and He finds me ways out, as the Bible says. And then I say, no, I'm not going to listen. I have chosen to quench the Spirit. I have chosen to follow my flesh. I can choose by following a desire that is more important at that time than God is to me. I can choose all kinds of other things, distractions, that will hinder the Holy Spirit working. And sometimes we do this and we think, well, the Holy Spirit works great for this church and that church, and we miss out and we're miserable because the Holy Spirit doesn't have its freedom. Because we've chosen to pour water all over it. What happens when I quench the fire then? It affects my walk with God. It affects my relationships with others. It affects my victory over sin. It affects my strength and sorrow. It affects my effectiveness as a witness. It affects my desire to do godly things. I just don't have it. The question is, now this next question is extremely broad. I understand that. But do you enjoy a life being filled with the Spirit? None of us are perfect, all right? So I understand there is going to be times in your day when you realize, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't filled with the Spirit. I've got to go apologize to that person. I understand. Fear takes over. My question is, is it something you're striving for? Or is it something that has become, I don't really need it? So I'm going to finish with two questions this morning. Before you can enjoy the power and the comfort and the strength of the Holy Spirit, you must have accepted Jesus as your Savior. So the first question is, do you know for sure if you die today, you'd go to heaven? I'm not asking if you're a Baptist. I'm not asking if you get baptized. We're going to do a baptism here in just a little bit. I'm not asking you if that's true. I'm asking, have you asked Jesus into your heart? If you die today, do you know for sure? If you're in our church and you don't know, it means you're seeking. 
You're looking for an answer. Can I tell you, the answer is not found in a Baptist church. The answer is not found in any church per se. The answer, hopefully, in that church is found in the Bible. All right, Joining and becoming part of a church, I think, is great. It's wonderful. It's necessary. But it's all after you have accepted Christ as your Savior. The question is, have you ever asked Jesus to save you? To say, preach, that's too easy. Exactly. Because years ago, Jesus died upon a cross and paid my punishment for my sin. And all I need to do is accept the free gift that Jesus asked me. If you don't know for sure, if you were to die today, that heaven is your home, you're not sure you're saved. You know there's a simple way to resolve that? With no pressure. In a little bit, I'll be standing down here on the main floor in front of the pulpit. You see, I'd like to know more about it. See me. I know that's a little nerve-wracking. No, you know, no one's going to embarrass you. You come see me, I'll introduce you to someone who will take you to a side room. And they will, with the Word of God, Share what God says about heaven. No pressure. You make the decision. If you're not sure today, I encourage you to seek out some and let them share what God says about heaven, not what a church says. Second question is this. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to control or are you quenching Him? Obviously, this is an issue in the church of Thessalonica because Paul, as he's finishing, made one of the comments, quench not the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to have its freedom. Allow the Spirit to have its direction. Allow the Spirit to have its desire. But some of us in our sin and our choices or whatever are quenching the Spirit constantly. May we today come back, confess whatever sin or thing that's that's hindering the Holy Spirit and ask Him for that filling. Ask Him for that strength and get our hearts right with God and allow Him to give us that freedom that allows us to be the dad we need to be, the mom we need to be, the husband, the, the wife, the teens, the servants of God that we need to be. Father, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us this morning, the privilege we have to worship you. Lord, I think about the Holy Spirit, and Lord, you promised us that a comforter would come. You promised us that we would receive power, and Lord, we can have that. I wonder if some of us struggle weekly in our Christian life because we do not enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, it's not something to be guilty about. It's something that we just need to acknowledge. And realize that there is an available power for us as Christians that we're not aware of, that we're not taking advantage of. And maybe today, we just need to get on our knees and ask you to fill us with your Spirit. And then, Lord, spend time with you and stoke that fire so that we can have a true, powerful Christian life. We cannot be done on our own. But, Father, there are things that will quench your Spirit. May we not be doing those things. May we focus. May we not let other desires pull us aside. May we not let sin hinder the filling of the Holy Spirit. Father, may we enjoy your working in our life. I pray if there's anyone here that's not saved, that today would be the day that they would accept Him as their Savior. If you head by an eyes closed, no one looking around, just a second, we're going to sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. If God has spoken to your heart, just a second, as we sing, I encourage you to come, turn this platform an old-fashioned altar. If you want to join the church or, or learn about baptism, come see me for one of those three reasons. You see, I just need to talk to God. I need to get some things right. I encourage you to come turn this platform an old-fashioned altar. Maybe even just kneel at your pew and let God have His freedom as we sing. Would you stand together with me? The head bowed, eyes closed, we sing together. If you know the words, I encourage you to sing them with me. Have thine own way, Lord. I encourage you. This is not...